Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kostas Mavridis. I'm a member of the European Parliament in the political group of the Socialists and Democrats, coming from Cyprus. This is my second term, and in this term, I'm the chair of the political committee for the Mediterranean. At the same time, I'm a member of the uh, joint parliamentarian committee between the European Parliament and Turkey. As far as this event, I feel very honored to be the host of this event, and I will explain why very, uh, in, very soon, in, in very short way. The event today is called The Current State of Turkey's Political and Civic Rights. The program of the event was essentially organized by a think tank called Vocal Europe, which is a Brussels-based think tank dedicated to research and communication on EU external relations and enlargement policy. To my understanding, Vocal Europe is a progressive voice that I would like to congratulate publicly and encourage them in their pursuit for democracy, rule of law, and especially civic, political, and social rights. Again, I'd like to explain why I consider this a special event. For many years, and especially the last few months, we are preoccupied or overwhelmingly occupied with the external policies of Turkey and not paying much attention to what's going on within Turkey. This, is, this event has, beyond what we are going to be hearing, has a symbolic gesture that we still do care about the internal matters in Turkey and we do care about people for their struggle and suffering. I would like also to thank in advance all the speakers, the moderators, and other contributors, contributors of this event, including especially my colleagues, my MEPs, one of them is sitting next to me, academics, media representatives, peace and social activists, and others. The event is organized in two panel discussions. Uh, the first one, the first discussion that we were about to listen, it's uh, called the current situation of civic and political rights in Turkey. Without further ado, I would kindly ask Mr. Henry Malos, former president of the European Economic and Social Committee and chairman, currently, of Vogel Europe, for his chairing of the first panel. Thank you very much. Uh, as you thank Vocal Europe, I would like to thank, uh, in name of all of us, in name of Vocal Europe, uh, our host, Mr. Kostas Mavridis, uh, to express our great gratitude. I will say first time uh, we met and I asked him about uh, possibility for him to host his event. He even didn't take any time for reflection. He immediately said yes. He immediately said yes because of the current situation of civic and political rights in Turkey, where we consider that uh, there is a growing fast deterioration, and this is the topic of his first panel, to see how far it is going in this deterioration on the civic and political rights, on rights in general for the, for the citizens. And the second panel will debate what do you can do. So this was my very short introduction. And now I will take, uh, give the floor to Mr. Zwalet, who will be our moderator for the first panel. Mr. Zwalet is a redactor of a famous uh, Belgian magazine, which is called Knack. Uh, it sounds knack like uh, something very, uh, very dynamic. So, like the uh, so I'm sure he will be very dynamic too. Please, have the floor. So uh, welcome, everyone, to this uh, debate. Um, I uh, propose that without further ado, I'll uh, just introduce uh, our uh, first three speakers. Uh, to my right, uh, we have uh, Evan Inchir, who is an MEP for uh, Arbitar Partiet, 
Socialdemokraterna, which is the uh, uh, Swedish Social Democrat Party. Uh, and as you might have guessed by the name, uh, she's of Kurdish origin and is uh, working here as part of the EU-Turkey Joint Parliamentary uh, Committee. Uh, to my uh, uh, and to my left uh, is uh, Yavuz Baydar, who is the editor-in-chief of uh, Ahval, which is an online news website that publishes in Turkish, Arabic, and English. He's uh, one of the co-founders of P24, which is one of the last platforms for independent journalists in uh, Turkey. And uh, directly to my left is uh, Mr. Ugur Tok, who is the director of the um, platform for Peace and Justice, which is a Brussels-based think tank that monitors the state of human rights, uh, especially in uh, Turkey. Um, maybe let me start with you, Mr. Uh, uh, Baydar, and um, uh, recent happenings, because uh, it was only yesterday that uh, Osman Kavala uh, was uh, released and then uh, detained again. Osman Kavala is a, a famous uh, philanthropist um, who is, has been accused of playing a role in the uh, 2016 uh, coup d'etat, I um, mean, what are you, I mean, what is your analysis of, of the what unfolded yesterday? Thank you for this timely question and thank you all for joining us. Uh, it's high, high time that we, we put it under uh, um, lens, uh, what's happening in, in Turkey. Let me, let me begin uh, by, by uh, a quote from the Human Rights Watch uh, in order to put it, what, the, what was happening yesterday in a context. Human Rights Watch 2019 report says, quote, as of July 2019, and I will give you some more figures and data as I speak, Minister, Turkish Ministry of Justice figures stated that 29,487, almost 30,000 people uh, in cases linked to the Gulen movement, uh, which Turkey's government terms as FETÖ, were held in prison either on remand or following conviction. Further, Human Rights Watch continues in that report, an estimated 8,500 people, including elected politicians and journalists, my colleagues, are held in prison on remand or following conviction for alleged links to, with the uh, PKK, KCK, uh, etc. Add to this the fact that uh, since then, the incarcerated Kurdish dissidents have reached probably beyond 10,000 as of today. <coughs> And if you add to these figures the human rights defenders, civil rights activists such as Osman Kavala, defense lawyers, and other journalists, um, er, this, this report uh, leaves us with a horrifying picture of, uh, uh, of a country which to some decisions, according to some decision makers here in Brussels, uh, as they pretend, is still a candidate for EU membership. It's a joke, of course. We speak of a country you know, whose government, uh, if Human Rights Watch uh, figures are correct, which they are, holds nearly 50,000 people as political prisoners, by definition. This is what the report says. So yesterday's farce called Gezi trial, it doesn't only show us uh, uh, how um, the, the judiciary has turned into a political toy or tool for the government, um, also a proof on how far how deep the collapse of the rule of law has, has become, has, has turned into, it is now a ruin. A symbol for uh, a quest for justice, that's who Osman is, uh, is ju he's just one of those tens of thousands of people who, whose lives are left to rot behind the bars. While major bulks of European political segment, here and in Strasbourg, etc., etc., um, remain in, either in apathy or in pretension with rosy glasses, that all is not that bad in Turkey, how much worse one can ask uh, it should get before uh, one can change or though they can change their minds. Um, so um, my, I will give you some figures about, in short, about how these patterns of uh, the fourth estate, the Turkish media has been, has, has been crippled because it is the segment that suffered the most. Uh, coincidentally, uh, I put the beginning of the decline or demise of the Turkish media to Gezi Park protests six years ago, June 2013. That's when President Erdogan furiously, seeing an opportunity, accelerated and systemized, systemized, systematized his moves to cripple the critical parts of the, of the Turkish media. 
Um, to put it simply, uh, and I will give you in five points, the media strategy of Erdogan, beginning with Gezi, was to subordinate large segments of the media and destroy or paralyze the remnants, the critical parts, uh, which are of different inclinations, leftists, Alevis, Gulenists, uh, Kurds, uh, you name it. It's a, it was a pluralist picture, more or less, before Gezi Park protests. So now, after five years, six years, uh, he reached successfully, it was a great success by President Erdogan to reach, the con to gain control over 93% of the Turkish media sector by way of either direct or indirect editorial control in the newsrooms, in the channels, newspapers. So as a result, of course, Turkish public is ripped off uh, uh, to an, basically off, of its right to, to get information. And um, nearly total news blackout is being imposed and immense self-censorship. So um, this is uh, what uh, brings Turkey, Turkish public, or puts a wall between the public and the reality. And this is, uh, of course, leaving no room for democracy to breathe. It's, I'm just going to uh, let the other speakers uh, pick in on, on this, if I may. I, if I may give you some, some titles on the what's, what's these things happened. Just give me, give me two minutes, please. Uh, the patterns are, because this is important for the public to know, what he did in the six years. First, jailings and firings. Now we have about 197 people, journalists in jail. More than 6,000 journalists since Gezi, according to Turkish Union, have been fired, left had to leave their jobs. Again, to go to the media capture, he continued Erdogan meaning uh, that, that by force or by persuasion or by threats, left the media businessmen to take over the media segments that may be critical or, or not intrustable for him. And now, of course, these big media groups are under the control of businessmen who are close to uh, Erdogan. And two more points, TRT, the state broadcaster. The pledge initially of AKP was to turn the state broadcaster into a proper public broadcaster with the diversity and uh, the, the platform for public discourse. He went to the other direction. The TRT is even far more under the state control, government control, pure government mouthpiece as an Anatolian agency. And uh, another point is closure of media outlets, which happened 2015 on. More than 195 media outlets, TV channels, newspapers, etc., etc., during the state of emergency, peaking there, have been shut down, closed down, raided, and even their digital archives deleted, which to me, to me as, a, as a journalist, is a barbaric act. And uh, this is then the legal measures, of course, many laws, anti-terror law, you, most of you know it, they are abused in a way to jail journalists. And finally, administrative measures since 2017 referendum, um, a directorate of communications established directly under Erdogan in the palace is now acting in a Goebbelsian manner. It monitors media every day, threatens, calls and intervenes in the newsrooms, sometimes leading to identical headlines in, the, in various, several newspapers, and also is now the only authority to issue press cards uh, arbitrarily. So this means, of course, uh, a chilling effect uh, of, of, of for the journalists who want to continue to carry press cards. This leads to an immense wave of self-censorship because no, neither domestic nor foreign colleagues want to lose their accreditation rights, etc., etc. I could go on, but I leave, it. I leave the rest for, for the Q&A. Thank you. About the state of the Turkish media. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Incher, maybe you could tell us, I mean, all of this must have a profound effect on, on, on Turkish society as a whole. I mean, could you dig into that? I mean, what kind of effects do you see? First of all, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Um, uh, it is a very actual topic and a very important topic. And I also would like to uh, underline what, uh, what uh, MEP Mavridis before said, that even though, of course, a lot of focus has been on the invasion, uh, which is a very, very uh, serious situation right now in uh, the Rojava, uh, Rojava region in Syria, but we shouldn't uh, forget what the escalation and the continued oppression um, in uh, Turkey also. Um, I actually think this whole topic, it's also important to put it in a bit more longer historical um, context without, uh, without going into history too much because 
What has happened actually the last year is that it has escalated. But the oppression per se has existed in Turkey since for many decades, to, to, to put it mildly, mildly. Not at least the minorities have been under oppression. The Kurdish, the Alevite, the Christian minorities, we know by history uh, what happened during the 1915s uh, uh, um, uh, with the Armenians, the genocide on Armenians and uh, Assyrians and uh, so on. Um, so one thing I think it's quite important to, in the future, I know that we were not supposed to go into the solution, the next panel would do that, that would need to be done in Turkey uh, for the future is to ch change our constitution, a constitution that accommodates all its people, not only few of its people. Um, the privilege, the right to democracy, to enjoy democracy shouldn't be a privilege of few, it should be the right of all the people uh, in the country. However, as we know, yes, uh, the last years um, it has escalated in comparison to uh, a few years before that, everybody thought that, yes, there is a new person in charge in the country, there might be some changes, not at least when it came to the rights of the minorities in the country, and then it uh, escalated uh, mostly with the 2016 um, uh, so-called uh, coup d'etat uh, attempt. And as uh, the previous speaker said, we see uh, journalists being jailed. I think Turkey, as far as I know, Turkey is the, uh, the country with the most amount of journalists uh, in jail. And it's also, uh, when it comes to um, a press free freedom index of from 2019, it is on number 157 out of 180. It shows um, the seriousness of, uh, of uh, how the situation has escalated and how critical the situation has become um, in, uh, in Turkey. I have my own, for example, family members. One of my aunts, she was, uh, she was forced away from her job at the university because of uh, um, one of uh, our um, uh, relatives making a Facebook status. She, while she didn't do anything, she was the one being forced. Uh, they took her job away. She got it uh, one, two years later. Um, uh, but, uh, but this still shows how critical the situation uh, has become uh, in the country. And I think one thing that is quite important in this, with this escalation in the country, is that the opposition in the country uh, actually need to find a way to try to gather and try to find common solutions. Because as long as the op opposition is not on the same page, the situation will continue. If my, my personal point of view is this. If, for example, CHP didn't agree on withdrawing the impunity from the uh, M MPs uh, in uh, the parliament a couple of years ago, the situation might not have gone as fast as it did, or if some of the opposition also didn't give green light for the invasion in Rojava, the invasion might have not been as easy as it, uh, as it became for the Erdogan um, uh, government. So I think um, th the situation is quite serious, and uh, there is quite a lot of things that could have also been done from, uh, from the opposition side that I would actually like to see a change on in the future for a good and better solution on this. Topic. Maybe that's an interesting topic to, for uh, Mr. Tok uh, to um, uh, expand on. I mean, how much of what is happening now and is happening in past years is, I mean, do we simply have to blame uh, Mr. Erdogan for all of this? Or, or I mean, is there, I mean, is there a sort of a joint responsibility? Yeah. All right. Thank you very much for the question. I think in order to uh, uh, answer this question, we need to understand the, the judiciary in Turkey and the, um, the history behind it. Uh, judiciary in Turkey has never been actually um, impartial nor uh, independent since the foundation of the new uh, republic um, in, in Turkey. Um, up until 2002, when the uh, AKP government came in charge, um, judiciary supposed to be uh, hand by hand with the army and the ultra seculars. So, given the fact that the new government is uh, political Islamists, uh, there was a huge crash on, uh, from 2002 onwards, and um, this clash um, emerged as a head, head scarf crisis, and then uh, 2007 presidential elections. 
because the president's wife was uh, with headscarf. That's why it became a real problem in Turkey. And it, it became a, a, a remnant as well uh, with the closure of um, the case of closure of uh, AKP government. So um, AKP government wanted to find allies within the context in order to cope with the, uh, the uh, governing uh, powers, uh, real powers behind the state. And they approached, uh, they rely on to liberals, they approach to the Kurds, minorities, uh, Gulenists, European Union, etc. Uh, within the first six months, we know within the six months of their, um, they came in charge, they visited 25 European capitals and promising rule of law, democracy, Western norms. It was amazing. Uh, they attracted lots of support at the time. Uh, but the Kudanis, uh had has something special. They, they have profound uh, bureaucrats uh, within bureaucracy. So they worked with them. Uh, when in 2010, there was a referendum. Um, with, with the referendum, I think AKP government opened all ways to uh, the higher judiciary to Gudenis. And it was a start of Gudenis AKP alliance up until 2013. In 2013, there was the biggest um, corruption scandal in, in, Turkish, in Turkish history. There were about 47 um, bureaucrats, uh, member of cabinets, sons of uh, ministers involved in huge corruption scandal. An Iranian gold trader bribed these people. Um, police and uh, prosecutors investigated uh, this, the, the case. Um, Erdogan immediately blamed uh, the Gudenis movement and, um, and there the split started from 2013 uh, on. I think uh, from there on, they decided to control a uh, higher council of uh, prosecutors and judges. So uh, they openly supported, um, they promised, they made, they made promises to judges if they vote um, their union, their backed up union, they would increase salaries of judges as well as um, um, forgive amnesty for the uh, judiciary uh, disciplinaries, so that they will forgive, forgive these uh, judges. Um, when they um, get the power in the in, uh, higher council of uh, judges and uh, prosecutors, it was, of course, the, it means that the a very crucial step because the, that, that is, uh, institution was appointing prosecutors and judges in, in the country. It was against the power of, of separation, of uh, uh, separ separation of powers. Um, this was uh, attracted the attention of um, international community. The Venice Commission opposed this, and. Um, and the European Network of Councils of Judges, ENCJ, dismissed the Turkish member because of they are not impartial and independent anymore. Um, however, this was not uh, taken, it, it took any attention by the, by the government in Turkey. Well, uh, right after um, the, the 2013 scandal, Turkish government formed a um, um, new form of courts called criminal peace courts. It was specifically formed to, uh, the president himself openly said that, uh, this court has been established to eradicate Gulenist structure, all forms in judiciary, uh, bureaucracy, police, um, everywhere, universities. So that was crucial as well. Um, and this, uh, this was really criticized by internally and externally, and the chief judge of the Court of Cassation, San Selçuk, um, said that this is a kind of different form of 
um, McCarthyism. So targeting a special group, forming a special court, and blaming them uh, and purging them. Uh, I'm, I'm going to let uh, Mr. Bider expand on this um, and, and, and maybe ask as well. I mean, is there, is there still any wiggle room for I mean, resistance or, or, or civil society to, to claw back, uh, as it were? It's getting narrower and narrower. I think if you're, if you're referring to media, because I'm part of that, uh, that's my profession. If you're referring to this, I think uh, what we are facing, as I said, 93% of, of, of the takeover of the media by, by Erdogan means an unprecedented situation. Uh, uh, Turkish media has never suffocated that badly. The, the, the self-censorship turns, it's not only about jail, you know, it's all, all about, also about <coughs> newsrooms turning into some form of open-air prisons. Uh, where uh, you, you, have, you know your ways. There are taboos. Uh, for example, any kind of coverage about corruption linked to Erdogan, his family, or his close circle is, is, is not, uh, is a taboo. So is the Kurdish issue becoming as the Syrian quagmire gets deeper. But in terms of uh, professional resistance of journalists, I think everything is moving to online now because what was most important for Erdogan, since Gezi especially, Gezi showed that, was to control the TV. According to UNESCO, over 85% of Turkish society uh, members are getting their news only from TV channels. So was the pattern of Putin and elsewhere. Uh, so this was the magic formula. So online remains only way. A lot of my colleagues are opening their own YouTube channels, uh, uh, which I think attract urban, Western urban and Kurdish provinces, youth, etc., younger generations, and online activities, professional activities like Ahwal or our competitors abroad or in Turkey, Duvar, for example. Um, that's where we are expanding. But in general, in terms of civil society, I think the, the, what's happen, happening with Osman Kavala and then also the, the, the trial about rights defenders, civil society activists, I think. We are at another milestone breaking point of how decisive the regime under Erdogan is to break the backbone or continue to break the backbone further of the, any kind of civil society movement, any kind of uh, a formation of a democratic front, if you will, or democratic alliance, driving a wedge between the Kurdish, solid Kurdish uh, civil democratic movement and the rest. That's what's been, that is the strategy, that is the pattern. So things are um, uh, worsening uh, as uh, every day, uh, I think, under the circumstances, because it's a survival, political survival struggle for Erdogan as well as his opponents. Uh, and I think we are going to see far more uh, feathers flying about, far more dust, far more, uh, uh, far more uh, um, uh, sort of chaotic-like circumstances, because Turkey, and mind this, Turkey is becoming ungovernable under the circumstances. Economic crisis, administrative crisis, social crisis, polarization. This, this is, the whole system is showing very strong uh, signs, indications that it cannot, the machinery cannot roll any further. And there has to be some sort of resolution, either by civil democratic means or God forbid, other means. But it is leading, the, the, the path, the arc, the water flowing on the arc is, is leading to that direction, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Ungovernability is the issue. Mm -hmm. um, you, you mentioned the, the, the Kurdish question, of course. Um, maybe uh, Ms. Inshi would like to expand on that. Um, I mean, there's a lot of uh, um, discussion about whether Erdogan is... Um, an anti-Kurdish president or isn't? I mean, his defenders will say that no president has invested that much in uh, Kurdish regions and Mr. Erdogan, I mean, would you, what is your view on that? Is, is Mr. Erdogan an anti-Kurdish president? I mean, for me, that's pretty clear that he is. Uh, he is uh, both anti-Kurdish president, but he's also a um, anti-everybody who believes in democracy and peace uh, president, I would say. Um, I, yeah, uh, that, I think, is pretty sure. One example is actually there is right now a process going on or a process that will be started against four Kurdish parties uh, whom names contains of Kurdistan. 
um, who are going to be closed down. If that's not anti-Kurdish uh, anti and Kurdistan, I don't know what is. Um, but uh, if we put that even aside, we see um, uh, previously also that um, the, the, uh, the, that the Kurdish politicians have constantly um, been under threat. Salatin Demirtas, for example, he's in jail because of uh, making statements that, according to Erdogan, uh, is a threat to the Turkish, uh, Turkish state uh, to, obviously, to ask for human rights, democracy for all people within the country seems to not be uh, his taste. Um, so, yes, he's, an, according to me, an anti-Kurdish um, president. I would also just very shortly want to uh, touch upon what my colleague before said about the institutions. I also do believe that, I mean, the institutions are right now in Turkey in harm. Um, it's easy to break down institutions, but it's not as easy to build up. We can just see it around Europe even um, when it, that it takes decades to build solid democracies, but it doesn't take as long time to break those country, those uh, uh, those principles, Hungary and Poland, in my views, is a practical example of that it just took a few years to, dismantle, to start dismantling democracy and uh, violating fundamental rights and, uh, rule of, and putting rule of law at stake. Um, so I do believe that something needs to be done. And here I do believe that the European Union also have a responsibility um, with the U.S. Uh, backing uh, when it comes to taking a leadership uh, for, for uh, le leadership, which U.S. actually had for many decades or many years uh, on promoting democracy and so on globally. There is a vacuum. We can either, as the European Union, fill that vacuum, or we could let Russia or China fill that vacuum. I would personally not want Russia, Russia and China be the ones filling that vacuum, because they do not really uh, promote those values that I think are essential. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, what is always surprising to me as a journalist when I um, uh, write about Turkey and when I speak to Turks is that even though all of this is, is happening, the enthusiasm I mean, further, the unquestion almost unquestionable loyalty towards Erdogan and the party, it remains quite impressive. Um, I mean, Mr. Tuck, do you have an explanation for that? Why, why is that? I, well, I think initially, yeah, sorry. Take the mic. Sorry. Well, what we know today's Erdogan was not the same Erdogan what we know when he came in charge, actually. Uh, Fifteen years ago, the narrative was very different. Uh, you know, his approach towards the Kurdish issue, I remember at least, uh, he said, even if it costs my career, I will sort, sort this problem out. We remember this. And from that po point, he came to the current uh, bombing southeastern Turkey with F-16s. So a huge difference there. Um, uh, f f from that perspective, uh, he's not the person that be. Uh, what is your? Could you repeat your question again? Sorry. Could you repeat the question again? Uh, how do you how do you explain the enthusiasm yes. that with the Gezi Park with the Gezi Park incidents? What I uh, I think a Gezi Park uh, incident is the the uh, exact threshold because up until that time he had the support, he had the public support, but after then. Um, what I realized, he understood that uh, he was losing power in my, and he might need to leave office. That's why he decided to polarize the country. So what he had was 40-45% of the uh, votes in the country. And uh, he, once you polarize the country, you have your own portion and you freeze all uh, percentages. These people, if, if they, you know, when you polarize the country, uh, even you criticize the other party positively, constructively, you cannot make a change. From seculars or Kurds or liberals, if there's a, uh, cons even constructive con uh, 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 criticism comes to the, the government, they reject it. It's unacceptable. This is because you're from the other side. There you're blaming us, whatever. So this goes to an um, unsolvable uh, way. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, I've been uh, asked to open the floor for um, questions. So if there are any questions, um, I would like to remind you that uh, brevity is the soul of wit. Uh, uh, so uh, please do, do keep your questions limited to, let's say, about 30 seconds. 
uh, maximum. Um, if you have a question, raise your hand and uh, uh, present yourselves, and then go ahead. Go ahead. Michael. Hi, I'm Aicha. I'm a Turkish student in Maastricht University. And as far as I know, there's more than 500, 500 children lives and growing up in prisons with their mothers. Can you please mention about it too? Because it's, I think, very important issue now. Thank you. Go ahead. So, not, not a question, but an update and a, a remark, let's say. Uh, first of all, my name is Yavuz Aydın. I'm one of those thousands of judges and prosecutors purged by uh, Turkish government uh, that night. Uh, so, uh, while you were speaking, you know, things are taking place so fastly in Turkey. Uh, right after this uh, panel started, the uh, Turkish uh, Council of Judges and Prosecutors delegated the inspectors, judicial inspectors, to launch a disciplinary investigation against the panel of judges who released, who tried to release Osman Kavala yesterday. So, and I, my remark is, I think, as Jan Dunda, Jan Dunda says, yeah, Jan, as Jan Dunda says, really he tweeted today after this, uh, everybody will understand that there is no judicial independence and there is no rule but law of the rulers when the last judge will be jailed. So I hope it would not be the case. Uh, I'm going to let the speakers react to the first question first. Maybe. Oh, sorry. Just 10 seconds question. Just 10 seconds. And I think that would be very interesting. I would like to know, and this question is directed especially to the panelists coming from Turkey, how would this event be perceived or portrayed by the government controlled media in Turkey? That would be very interesting to know. Do you understand my question? Uh, so let's go for the, the, the babies in prison question first. Yeah, it's a very important topic, of course, um, and we are very bad on actually mentioning both children and young people's um, situation in Turkey also. So there are a lot of young ch uh, b children um, uh, without parents, uh, growing up without parents because of their parents being, uh, many of them also arbitrary, on, uh, because of arbitrary reason being put in jail. And I know uh, when it comes at least to the youth uh, level, I, it was not so many years ago, I was myself in the youth movement of the Social Democratic, um, you, uh, Social Democratic Party in Sweden, and, but I was also the Secretary General of our International Youth Movement, the International Union of Socialist Youth. And one of our member parties was the HCP youth. Uh, youth um, and it was sometimes very hard to get in touch with them. Why? Sometimes I myself get frustrated, but then I got to know why. Because one of the ways of weakening the opposition was to also put, uh, put the young people in jails. So what they were doing, for example, and I've seen it my, with my own eyes, is uh, doing the demonstration provoking the young people to use violence just to be able to put them in jail. And then you get rid of those people who maybe have the energy to go on the streets. So that was uh, the young people and the, the children in Turkey is actually suffering a lot. So I can just apologize. We didn't mention it before. Can I comment on that? Yes. Yeah. Go. Go ahead. So I would like to comment on the, the 500 babies in jail uh, comment. It was about two years ago, I think, I was approached by uh, Fox News in, uh, in U.S., uh, and uh, a newsmaker uh, approached me and uh, they asked, because they knew that we, were, we would fo we'd be following the, the judiciary in, in Turkey, they actually wanted to find an uh, interview uh, with some women who stayed in Turkish jails with their babies and children. And I con tried to contact to, you know, uh, find the, the uh, correct people for her and uh, which I found, I think, 20, 25 people, but most of them were irrelevant. So I decided to ring them one by one in order to scrutinize and find the correct people. They, she wanted three people, and I just wanted to find these three people and ring them, ring them one by one and uh, listen to their stories. 
One of them said, yes. Um, I, had, I, I was in jail. I think she was in uh, uh, Greece or something. She said that she, was in, um, she stayed in uh, prison with her babies. But actually, the baby was not in jail. The baby brought, brought to jail daily basis for about 15 minutes or 20, uh, 30 minutes for, the, for you know, breastfeeding the baby because the baby was so young. Uh, she explained that. I, I tried to understand exactly what was the worst thing you, you lived with your, with your experience. She said, um, I, it was my first time in, in jail, and uh, every day that angry police officers uh, uh, were bringing my baby, my beloved, with angry face, and delivering it to me. I had only limited time, whether 30 minutes or 15 minutes, I don't know, and within this limitation of time, I had to breastfeed the baby. And the difficulty is, when I was returning the baby, it was not only me, but also other 80 women in our prison crying because baby was taken away from me. The second thing, what was very touchy for her, I was innocent, and I had to breastfeed the baby. Unfortunately, I had, I had so much milk, uh, but I was not able to breastfeed the baby, and I had to suck myself into the toilet. That was the worst moment. I had to go to the toilet. It was a very dirty place. And my tears were mixing with the clean food that I had to uh, feed the baby. So it was a very touching moment for us. Otherwise, if, well, I think it was a problem for, for a woman if, you, if they do not uh, apparently breastfeed the baby, the, the, the milk collected there. And um, yeah, that's the very touching moment. I just wanted to uh, share that very moment uh, upon the question of the, la the lady. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Uh, yeah, um, your, your remarks and also uh, response to, to Mr. Mauritius. I think uh, I mentioned nearly 50,000 political prisoners. This is not a joke. This is a reality. If you, if you read the Human Rights Watch reports, and there are many stories like this, not only from uh, mothers, but from other people. And one of the staunchest persons mm -hmm who every day reports and puts them on record is, his name is Ömer Faruk Gergerlioğlu. He's a devout um, uh, person, doctor, uh, founder, founding member of Muslim there, which sort of is sort of conservative, non-leftist segment, let's say. And he's one of the very few, maybe two or three deputies that work properly in Turkish parliament's opposition segment. Rest, don't care. They just get their salaries, mind you. This, this, is, this is the reality. And Ömer Faruk uh, Gergerlioğlu is, has a YouTube channel. And we report, and he's also uh, 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 part of our Ahval team. He's, he's, uh, uh, he's doing podcasts with us, bringing case after case after case. And I was having a conversation with Cengiz, one of the, the other speakers this morning. And uh, we were talking about the ridiculous reaction of Mr. Sanchez Amor yesterday to, uh, as a reaction to acquittal of Osman Kavala. And my source is Cengiz, and he said, when the Turkey rapporteur, Mr. Sanchez Amor, visited recently Turkey, he didn't even bother to meet Ömer Faruk Gergerlioğlu, this HDP deputy. This is, uh, I think, bringing me to the response to Mr. Mavrides. I think your question is, is irre irrelevant, because everybody knows how the Turkish media's main 90% will, will report about this. It's irrelevant. I think the relevant question is how the media in European Union will report about this, this event and how the decision makers in the EU uh, will, will react to what, we are be, what is being told here. Ignore, never mind about the Turkish media. We will do our best. But I think add to this also this, this, uh, these stories, this despair of any segment of Turkish opposition and my colleagues, my journalists who are observing this with the conscience, uh, with pain every day, I think you should 
everyone should have in mind that there is a deep EU fatigue in Turkey across the table. Everything that, had to, that could go wrong went wrong, mainly starting from the, 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 the Cyprus referendum, 2004. From then on, one erratic decision after the other, and many other things, Sarkozy effect, everything. So I think one golden opportunity was lost, and one thing led to the other, and now we are, whenever I come to Brussels, I see apathy. Turkey is a lost case. We don't, this is Orient, born pour Lorient. We don't have anything to do with this country, etc., etc. It's schadenfreude also. This is what, uh, what the Turks, they cannot do, etc., etc. But Turkey, many good people in Turkish opposition felt abandoned and, and left out, unfortunately. So there are all sides to the reality, you know. Um, this is where we are uh, in, 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 in today's world. Some more questions? Yeah, go ahead. Um, hello, my name is Maria Brozo and I'm coming from the European Think Tanks Group. Uh, yesterday we saw the, um, the statement from Mr. Bacheli about the uh, rumors or the um, conspiracy theories for the second uh, coup d'etat. I, I don't believe, uh, I think it's Ramos, it's not something that is feasible right now, but I would like to have a comment from Mr. Yavuz uh, by Dar for if this scenario was a real uh, scenario, what the, that would mean for the political rights in Turkey and for civil society. We'll take another question. Oh, go ahead. Yes, thank you. My name is Olga Kosmidu. I would like to ask a question to Mr. Baidar. Um, I have read that Mr. Akinji said that uh, if there is no solution to the Cyprus problem in the next months, there is a real danger that uh, Erdogan will declare the northern part of Cyprus as a Turkish province. Do you think that this is possible? Um, we'll take these two questions to start. Okay. Um, Mr. Baida? So in my analysis, I mentioned the, 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 the ungovernability effect of, of Turkey. Um, the, the, the snowballing of the, the, the aggressive nationalism is a result of, of, the, of the ungovernability uh, of, of Turkey or the, the, the ruling coalition the AKP and MHP coalition um, has fed these conditions. So as a result, um, the state is now under the control of this nationalist segment and all this rhetoric turning also into the deeds of, of Rojava, uh, invasion of Rojava, and also now ongoing fighting in Idlib. The Libya, uh, the so-called Blue Homeland the memorandum with the Saraj government, all of them are in a, in a big package as a result of that, and also Cyprus, as mentioned in the, in the question. It's um, sort of an expected result of, of in such political conjunctures. Uh, we have seen that in post-Versailles uh, moment in, in Germany, which led to the birth of Hitler, because dissatisfaction with, of the people, uh, but what they see as injustice of what was Versailles, for too many Germans was injustice cruelty or, or humiliation. And now, in a way, similar comparable situation is developing. Turkey is looking back to its past and sees ah, opportunities, wrongs to be corrected, etc. So this can be uh, seen as a part of the rhetoric, which can turn into serious deeds, because uh, there is now ungovernability coupled with compasslessness in, in Ankara. So it's, it's a boat that goes, that could go anywhere. Uh, and uh, that's as far as I can tell. And this, this requires a resolution in the end of the day. Uh, but the opposition is weak and also is dragged into the flood of nationalist uh, discourse. Uh, main, main opposition is, is also repeating most of the themes of the nationalist melodies. Uh, this makes it even more volatile. Uh, uh, under the circumstances. Regarding the other question, it's a big, uh, it's about uh, how much, $20 million question, but the conjuncture 
is open to all sorts of possibilities. Um, in any case, if you, what your question was or had any grain of truth, I think it would be linked automatically to early elections or election time for, for Erdogan in times of despair. Early elections is, to me, of, of no serious consideration. Erdogan has lost slices of, of his, his um, water base. It's now between 30 35 percent. It's not as solid as before, as you mentioned. And he is fully aware of that. But he hasn't lost them to, to any mm -hmm. other alternative. Because it's like you have, you're, you're, you're swimming from the beach and you have a floating something and you go up there, you suddenly feel unsafe. It's full, but you don't see any other uh, you know, floating thing around and you don't know how to swim well. This is the vaulters of AKP, unsecure. So they always feel that they have to stick to that mm -hmm. boat or floating thing. So he, does, he hasn't lost them. He's lost them, but he can get them back, he thinks, because they have no alternatives. So in this kind, this is a bait, of course. If you ask me, annexation of, of North Cyprus to Turkey is, is an option, uh, is, a, is a possibility. Rather weak, but yes, it is possible. Because as I said, mistake after mistake after mistake of the European Union, lack of foreign policy of, of the European Union has led to this. The, the erratic referendum, the, the tr erratic response to the referendum, Cyprus referendum, it was a mistake to import a country with a conflict. This is where we are. Um, I'm going to give the last question before we wrap it up here. Actually, I just wanted to correct a statement. Uh, Mr. Akinji did not say that Mr. Erdogan wants to annex Northern Cyprus. Mr. Akinji was asked by a journalist, what about in the case of annexation of Northern Cyprus by Turkey? And he said that would be a catastrophe. That would be a catastrophe for Turkey and for Cyprus. And then he continued on saying that Cyprus is very close to a permanent partition, which should alarm all peace lovers in Cyprus, Greek and Turkish Cypriots. Thank you. Um, but the fact that it was said, the, the inherent in the question, is the, the, the notion of or risk of whatever you say, the annexation of North. This is, this is inherent in the question. I definitely agree. But that was not a diagnosis by Mr. Akinji. So he never said Turkey is about annexing North Cyprus, just to correct this information. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to uh, offer Mr. Mavridis the last uh, question or intervention no, um, before we wrap. Would be just, my intervention would be just procedural. I think that today's event is about what's going on in Turkey, and I would love to talk about uh, Cyprus, but this is not the right time. Uh, so uh, let's respect the topic that we have in front of us. And um, with that, Mr. Moderator, you have the floor. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you very much for your attention. So we have uh, wrapped up the first uh, panel right now. We're going to switch. Uh, uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I implore you to uh, follow uh, the Vocal Europe, who organizes the debate on Twitter. Thank you very much. We have no time, and this is a live streaming. We can go on with our second panelists. And this uh, panel, it's basically uh, a continuation of uh, the first panel, perspectives on what to do regarding the situation of civic and political rights in Turkey. Uh, without uh, further ado, I will pass the floor to, my, to the moderator sitting next to me. Um. Dear speakers and participants, welcome to the, our second part of the panel. And uh, as we discussed in the first part, um, the, the current situation in Turkey and, uh, is still seen not free, uh, according to academics, uh, politicians of uh, global standards, due to the low standards uh, of democracy, freedom ratings, vacant political rights, and uh, limited civil liberties. So, but in this uh, second part of our panel, I invite our speakers to share their perspectives uh, on what to do from the EU's point of view. Uh, the ones follow Turkey or Turkish modernization would very well know that uh, if democracy was a dance for Turkey, Europe would be Turkey's ultimate dance partner. Therefore, it's crucial to discuss the democracy in Turkey from the partner's perspective. And um, 
even though the uh, EU-Turkey relations today seem to be stuck in an inevitable cooperation for security and migration, and um, there are also, on the other hand, a priori challenges uh, the EU faces, such as European Green Deal, the budget for the next term, or um, uh, the Brexit. And, uh, but in this, in this panel, we aim to enrich the discussion on EU and Turkey relations, not only for a better democracy for Turkey, but also for a better partnership, which would help both actors to deal with the regional and global challenges. So now, without uh, giving uh, our speakers time more, uh, I want to start with, I was going to start with uh, Mr. Herman Tertz, but uh, unfortunately he had an emergency, so he told us he'll be back soon. So I will uh, turn my head to Mr. Lucas Mandel, and uh, yeah, uh, the word is yours. Thanks for the invite, and thank you for drawing attention on this important, crucial topic, since Turkey is huge, Turkey is a neighbor, Turkey is the second largest army in NATO, and Turkey plays a crucial role geographic, geographically and due to its uh, geopolitical position. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Lukas Mandel. I'm a member of uh, the Foreign Affairs Committee, the Security and Defense Committee. I'm serving as a vice chair there, uh, as well as of the Home Affairs Committee and the sub-member of the Employment Committee in this House. I'm also heading the Transatlantic Friends of Israel group, and I'm a Vice President of the Assembly of European Regions. And in the Assembly of European Regions, we have also Turkish regions. And that's why I want to begin with a positive aspect of everything. And the positive aspect is that uh, sometimes the local level and the regional level uh, provides the political scene with officials who are less oriented on ideologies or on nationalistic approaches, but oriented on the living standards for their citizens in daily life. Uh, and that's where they are connected. We've experienced in times of huge conflicts, for example, between Russia and Turkey. Yes, that's only a few years ago. Uh, that the regions at the local level of these two countries worked closely together and exchanged views and experiences and provided each other with best practice examples. Same was true for Ukraine and Russia. Same was true for Albania and Serbia, and it remains true. So that's a positive aspect. Uh, that's also an aspect where I want to underline if uh, at least my political position is very critical on the current Turkish leadership that I feel a strong friendship with the Turkish people. And as we can see in election results, in surveys, in studies, and so on, it uh, will more or less be half the Turkish people, at least, who are also critical on their leadership if they are allowed to mention that. And that leads us to the problems inside Turkey. There are other experts as well on the panel and in the room on human rights issues within Turkey. Uh, you are also all aware of the aware of the recent development regarding Osman Kavala. It was uh, even the major, one of the major uh, news in the uh, public broadcasting morning news in my home country, Austria, today. And it's again an example of, uh, I would say, a lack of rule of law in Turkey. And a country that uh, shows a lack in rule of law uh, that also means a lack in democracy, because democracy depends on freedom of speech, uh, freedom of conscience, and more, uh, is uh, maybe uh, not on the right track. And we also have to doubt if uh, this second largest army in NATO uh, truly is uh, associated with NATO values today. It is not, in my view. And uh, it, uh, it, the, the Turkish leadership, of course, uh, harms these values towards its own people internally and also in external action, especially when I re remember the military action that began towards Syria in fall, when I think on the military action in Northern Africa that's uh, ongoing and uh, even more recent than the one in Syria, and uh, when I 
for example, think about uh, purchasing Russian equipment uh, for Turkey, which is uh, not my problem in the first place as an Austrian, but it's rather more already a problem as a European, and it's uh, as an Austrian who is, comes from a neutral state, a huge question mark regarding what NATO really means uh, if the second largest NATO army is, uh, is behaving like that. So these are some examples for, for the reasons for my critics on the current Turkish leadership, while acknowledging the size of Turkey, the history of Turkey, the great people of Turkey, the great contribution of many, many Turkish business people and others to the world. And uh, that's also why a positive future is possible. No, not the future with the Turkish EU membership. That's, in my view, impossible, given also the negative uh, influences Turkey is trying to do in the Western Balkans, where the six most probably future member states of EU are, uh, but uh, a proper relationship with uh, maybe a, a new Turkish leadership, democratically elected, and demo democracy is about change all over the world, everywhere. So there will someday be a new leadership, and the Turkish people will elect themselves their leadership. Uh, but uh, a new relation, a positive relation, a strengthened customs union maybe one day, uh, and uh, a, a mutual understanding on more issues and a, a living play, playing field in the relations with Turkey could be uh, a possible positive future. But a lot of things have to be solved until then. And as EU draws attention on violations of human values, European values, but universal values after all, which apply to each and every men and women and children in the world, we also have to draw attention on violation of these values in Turkey, as mentioned internally, uh, and also to the rest of the world. Thank you again for having me and for, yeah. Uh, yeah, for prioritizing this important issue. And now uh, I'd like to move forward to uh, Mr. Petras Ostrevicius. And uh, he is a member of parliament as well uh, from Renew uh, Europe, which is the successor to the ALDE group, Alliance of Liberals and Democrats for Europe. So we'd like to hear your also perspectives uh, on the topic. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon to everybody, and thank you very much for uh, vocal uh, <coughs> Europe inviting uh, me to address you on uh, this very important issue. Uh, I am representing uh, Renew Europe, which is... Uh, um, indeed, uh, built of uh, center around uh, liberals, democrats, uh, political group. Human rights uh, are very close to our hearts and minds. So I am privileged to speak and address uh, the issue of situation in Turkey. As probably you know, I mean, if you read the human rights reports uh, already for some time, uh, there is one tendency which worries us more and more. There is an increasing number of countries which are, are not free or are partially free. Where democracy is not observed, human rights and fundamental rights are not respected. Unfortunately, we should uh, make it clear that uh, Turkey is falling into that cat category of countries. The overall situation maybe might be described as backsliding generally, and in some uh, areas and in some sectors and some rights, it's a serious backsliding. To tell you that we are very happy, I mean, uh, having this assessment, not at all. We don't want, I mean, to see Turkey, I mean, uh, going to that uh, direction. And here are probably four points I, I want to bring to your attention. To my mind, uh, it's at most important to keep uh, ourselves engaged in monitoring the situation uh, in Turkey and pay enough political attention to the situation. Uh, it's easy to criticize sometimes from the distance, but it's good to sometimes to sit around with the same table to tell the truth to the eyes of people on the opposite side, ask for explanations, engaged into the dialogue. EU, I believe, has a particular role in this to play, and we have to be very comprehensive 
in approaching this situation. I believe we all agree that uh, the role and position of UN Human Rights Commissioner on uh, human rights must be supported uh, in each and every instance to look into situation in Turkey. Secondly, we have to do everything possible to stay engaged with opposition and human rights defenders in that country. And it, definitely so, EU must find ways and means to support independent voice within Turkish society. I know that there are sometimes ways uh, and an uh, approach uh, not to engage and uh, to stay away and uh, to leave the situation as it is. I don't think it's always the best way to choose. Support for civil society and opposition, and we are speaking uh, not just about the political support, we should think about the material support, is important and we have to invest as much as we can, agreeing with the opposition in this regard. You know, I believe, and I see a certain uh, possibility as uh, Sakharov Prize, which is a prize for human rights, voicing uh, the right uh, uh, kind of signal uh, for those who are in human rights defenders, Sakharov Prize is coming closer and closer to Turkey. I have a feeling that somebody from the Turkish opposition, human rights defenders, might match to the Sakharov Prize very soon. And it's already an indication of uh, things which are going on in Turkey. Thirdly, we have to keep exchange with Ankara, even the dialogue is and might be complicated. We, as well as Turkey, has um, a strategic interest to sustain cooperation with the EU. And fields of the, uh, of the cooperation are numerous, sometimes very, very strategic. It doesn't mean to, um, to stop uh, expressing our view, even a critical view, in that dialogue. But the dialogue has a clear meaning, at least to me. And fourthly, accession negotiations um, with Turkey, which are in a standstill for the time of being, and for the right reason, must be indeed conditioned to democratization and advance on a human rights situation, fundamental rights in general. I think it was very clear from a European Parliament side when we sent the signal already starting from 2018 and onwards that we are not going to close eyes and to accept the situation as it is. And you know, accession negotiations, although they are not proceeding, is a major instrument, let's call it even avenue for EU's role. We have a say and we are heard in Turkish society by expressing our opinion. Ladies and gentlemen, take any progress report, let's call it probably not a progress report, but a report on, uh, on Turkey, it's a very comprehensive paper. It's well done, it's clear, and it's on all sectors we are expressing our opinion. Political criteria very much uh, among them. And finally, once speaking about the situation in uh, Turkey, worsening situation on human rights, you know, of course, not the society is in charge of that situation. Those who are in leadership, and to those in leadership, I always have a good message. We will do in this House our utmost to approve Magnitsky Global Act, which is about human rights. And I will commit myself, and uh, you will see it in future to come. We will do it, and probably we will be successful.
even sending the right signal to Turkish leadership. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your speech, Mr. Um, Aus, um, Austria issues. It's a complicated. <laughs> it's, it's, I'm sorry. Is it? <laughs> Not Austria. 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 <laughs> okay. Uh, since um, uh, Mr. Arman Tars uh, not with us, uh, we can move forward to uh, respectable Turkish uh, uh, scientist and political scientist and columnist uh, Cenk Zaktar, and then we can uh, go to the question and. Uh, answer sessions, we'll have enough time for uh, your questions. Thank you, uh, thank you, and thank you to all. Lukas Vandel just mentioned, he said, uh, that, uh, Turkey is not a rule of law country. Uh, I would go further than that. Turkey is a totalitarian country, Lukas, I'm afraid. And if you need, uh, if you need uh, an example, just read the papers yesterday and today about uh, what happened to this poor man. Uh, who is in jail since over two years and a half and who is still under custody now that I'm talking and questioned about a, a, a so-called coup d'etat who was probably masterminded by Mr. Erdogan himself. So frankly, I mean, uh, we should call uh, a spade a spade and, uh, and uh, try to to re-evaluate our action, and I'm talking about now the, about the, the three main European institutions, how they are acting, how they should and they would act vis-a-vis -vis this country. So um, the, what is the praxis? I mean, the, the landmark decision, you just mentioned it, is the decision of the 26th of June. Uh, 2018, where the Council they decided that there is no need anymore to talk about the accession negotiations uh, and, and uh, not even the revision of the agreement on the customs union. So this is the, uh, the state of art regarding the, uh, the, the very uh, relations of the three institutions with Turkey since then, since June 2018. Um, the Commission just recently announced, as you all know, I mean, those who are interested in the enlargement policy, uh, a, a new guidelines regarding the uh, enlargement policy. It's, uh, and there is no mention of Turkey in it anymore. So I think uh, it's, uh, they are clearly openly talking about uh, WB6, the Western Balkan 6, and PASTA. And uh, there, there, there is no, I mean, it's, it's not there anymore. The IPA funds, the pre-accession funds, are cut, and I don't expect in the new uh, uh, financial framework that, that something will, will be uh, spared for Turkey either. Well, unfortunately, remains, as you mentioned, the civil society. I think their uh, uh, institutions, especially the Commission, who, has, who doesn't have much to do nowadays, frankly, uh, should think twice about how to channel funds, uh, be it through direct implementation or, or uh, through other means, to the Turkish civil society. It won't be easy. It, we need huge imagination, and um, because, first, there is hardly any NGO left, for instance, in the Kurdish uh, uh, towns. You know, they're all closed or they're forbidden. Or uh, NGOs are afraid, you know, of going openly uh, to, uh, to Europe. We are not at the stage of uh, Russia's Putin yet, but we, we may end up there uh, where, you know, taking money from outside might become a, an offense. So th this is so really, uh, a, 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 you know, a, a homework for all of us, but not only in Turkey, also channeling funds to the Turkish diaspora. Uh, you know, there is a new Turkish diaspora which is growing by the day, and uh, the, these people are trying to survive, literally survive, in the, in the countries where they are. So uh, this is for the Commission. Uh, let's now shift to the, uh, to our, uh, to, to, to the Council, which is, frankly, the, 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 the real body who runs the, the, the show uh, in the absence of the executive arm who, as I said, has very few to, to do regarding Turkey. I'm talking about the Commission. So the Council, well, the Council, uh, the Council is, of course, is not dealing with, with Turkey as such, but I think to, the Council is dealing with Turkey as a third country. I mean, the, the, be it uh, Egypt or uh, Venezuela, well, Turkey. I mean, okay, it's uh, you know, it's it's part of the uh, the, the uh, 
the, the agendas of the, the, the General Affairs Councils time to time, unfortunately always regarding a problem and hardly regarding any solution. And um, some people talk about um, the only remaining possible leverage-based approach to kind of bring about the human rights situation in Turkey, and that is the visa exemption deal. It's quite old. It started in 2013. So some people naively say that, I mean, let's put some uh, you know, strings on this visa waiver, which will never happen, by the way, and, uh, and put some human rights-related strings on it. I think we should really understand one key point here. The standards, norms, the principles and values of the present regime are in total contradiction with the standards, norms, values and principles of the European Union. So there is no, I mean, you can put any uh, string, any condition you want, the Turkish regime won't buy them. They won't, I mean, they will just ignore it. So I don't think that, that this this um, leverage-based approach, the last one actually, because all the others are dead, the accession negotiations and the revision of the, the customs union, won't work. We need a paradigm change here. We need now a paradigm change with Turkey, I'm afraid. We cannot consider Turkey as a maybe future member state of the European Union. We are not there anymore. Um, and we know so at the end of the day, uh, what is basically the policy of the European Council vis-à-vis -vis Turkey? Appeasement. Europeans appease Turkey for two key reasons. One, I think, is the, this famous deal of 18th of March 2016 on the migration, the so-called, uh, you know, the refugee deal. That, that, that's the first thing. I mean, they're trembling, and especially now with uh, an additional one million wh which may, who may uh, come in and cross Turkey to, to the islands, to the Greek islands and to Europe. That, that's the first. Uh, by the way, Merkel, uh, the Fräulein, came seven times since the coup d'etat in Ankara. Seven. It's unseen. Um, and the second uh, reason why the Europeans keep appeasing is I think they are, they are afraid of, uh, of the total collapse of Turkey. I think there is, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the very deep of themselves to, to you know, the, the, this huge phobia of seeing yet another 83 million Syria at the, at the doorsteps of the continent. Well, unfortunately, appeasement is like cortisone. You know, it's, uh, you know it doesn't cure anything. You, you have the impression that, that it cures, it doesn't cure. So more, more you appease, more the regime abuses. More the problems uh, increase. And this is exactly where we are. I'm not giving in the de details of the, pro of the, of the problems. But let, let me give you uh, a very fresh example of this, um, uh, of this appeasement policy. Uh, yesterday there was an ECOFIN. The, uh, the, the, the ministers of economy and finance, they were, about, uh, among others, uh, they were supposed to de decide about the new blacklist of countries who were, uh, you know, uh, not, not providing financial data uh, to the EU. Well, Turkey was is one of the, these countries, uh, unfortunately. And uh, but uh, the Koreper, I mean the, the ambassadors here, uh, they decided that Turkey should be given more time to uh, to to be included in this blacklist. In the meantime, what happens? I mean, the United Nations Security Council is openly talking about uh, about the uh, Ankara. Uh, re regime financing terror rings. I mean, it's, uh, it's an open secret. So it's there. So, I mean, the ECOFIN is just playing the three uh, monkeys, you know, trying to not, not to see what is happening and delaying the, the real action. Actually, we, what we need here is not appeasement, it's containment, I'm afraid. 
So this is where we are regarding the Council. Let, let's now go to the last uh, major institution. This is the European Parliament, where we are. So there, are, there has been a new le legislature, the sixth one, I think, uh, which started the, who started the work. Uh, good luck and uh, all my uh, you know, wishes of success uh, to the colleagues. But. Of course, there is a new team for Turkey. There is a new uh, rapporteur, Mr. Sancho, uh, Sanchez Amor, that, that Yavuz Baydar ju just mentioned, and of course, the, the co-chair of the JPC, uh, the um, <coughs> Uh, Lagodinsky Sergei. So uh, they are. They have started with much enthusiasm, and uh, Sanchez Amor, who knows actually quite well uh, Turkey, because he was uh, in charge of the um, human rights uh, and uh, election monitoring matters uh, at the OSCE. So he was quite uh, quite critical of the, the Turkish government at the time when he was coming and going. Suddenly, he came to Turkey and he fell, he fell in love uh, with, with Turkey and started, of course, he met many people, but not necessarily the right ones. Uh, Yavuz Baydar just uh, uh, mentioned that this uh, the MP uh, who is really in, involved in uh, deep, uh, you know, the, the grassroots action uh, regarding huge violations uh, in Turkey. He didn't meet him. And, uh, and my, my source is the, the MP himself, by the way. I just just asked him whether the Sanchez Amor met him. He said no. So, and um, but I think more seriously, he said the EU needs to maintain a credible accession perspective based on an objective assessment of the conditions. EU was com is committed to Turkey's accession process. There is no such a thing. He's talking for himself. I mean, and he's a reporter. Yesterday, with this, I, 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 I can't find the words to de describe what happened to my friend Osman Kavala, uh, this acquittal and then re, you know, de detention. He said Turkey is in the right path for normalization. He tweeted this. And a few hours later came the, uh, the, the, I would say, I'm sorry, but the slap on the face, <laughs> say that it's the total opposite of you know, what this normalization. I think we should be very careful with these words, normalization. Normalization with what? Normalization with the, with the totalitarian regime. Uh, and the, the, the other catch word is the new narrative. The new narrative. We need a new narrative. I remember very well at, at the time of Commission of Füle, I was involved in one of the, this, um, uh, this, you know, uh, initiatives. It was called Positive Agenda. But at the time, there was some ground to push for it. Now, today, I'm afraid there is hardly any ground to push for any positive agenda or, or any new narrative with, with Turkey. That, that, this is where we are. I think I will stop there. The, 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 uh, am I, have I uh, uh, respected your five minutes? Yes. yes. Thank you, sir. Yep. So. <laughs> so I will give the word uh, last time, but not least. Uh, to Mr. Mavridis, but uh, and then we can have the questions uh, for our speakers. Okay, thank you very much, uh, moderator. Uh, certainly, I'm not one of the panelists officially, but I'd like to make a short comment regarding the question what to do about Turkey given today's situation. Um, I will be very frank and blunt myself too. Um, <clears throat> In a way, responded to my colleague as well. Uh, I think that um, the appeasement policy that we have followed the last 10 years or so, judging by the results, let's be honest, it has totally failed. I will give one example. The human, the human record situation in Turkey today, it's much worse than what it was 10 years ago. And one more thing, I would dare to say publicly, and this is not the first time, by the Charter of International Criminal Court, I strongly believe that today's Turkish administration, led by Erdogan himself, has committed over and over again crimes against humanity, not only within Turkey, but also outside. And I will give one example. 
forcing the change of demographics is a crime against humanity. Ethnic cleansing is a crime against humanity. These type of so-called tools or policy tools are being publicly promoted by the AGP administration. And in fact, the embracing of the jihadists, either in Syria or in Africa or in Libya, it's something which is within the so-called policy tools of the AGP administration. And I will answer, finally, the question, what can we do as EU? I think if we follow the same policy, we should not expect different results. We need to change our policy. Well, I would offer a suggestion. I'm not saying that I do have the answer, but at least I could offer a different policy, given that a large portion of Turkish society is concerned today about everyday life and about the economic situation, I think that uh, combining that with the fact that EU is by far the major importer of Turkish products, I think we have a huge leverage on the exports from Turkey towards the European Union, and that's a tool we never dare to touch. I think it's long time due to dare that and hoping to have different results as well. That's all I had to say. Thanks for your contribution as well, Mr. Mabdes. Um, so I have uh, five minutes for your questions. Uh, we can receive them, but I'll collect them all together. Uh, so maybe three questions we can have. We can start with the lady. Okay. Thank you. And Mrs. Olga Cosmidou. A question to Mr. Mavridis, to Mr. Austrevicius, if I pronounce it uh, correctly, and uh, mostly to Mr. Akhtar. Europe has showed up to now pusillanimity. So how do you expect Mr. Mavridis to tackle the exports if they don't dare, except maybe Mr. Macron, to take smaller measures. Erdogan has understood quite correctly that Europe is afraid. Okay. Europe is afraid also to tackle the question of democracy inside Europe for certain countries. So how do you expect Mr. Erdogan not to understand this failure and how do you expect that Europe might take a political role when big countries show the way towards illiberal democracies? Okay, thank you very much for your question. And we had one, I think, yeah, please. Um, I want to ask if uh, anybody will give some voice to victims of these human rights abuses. And uh, when mentioning like we need new narratives, I think we need to hear the narratives of the victims themselves. There are thousands of them all over Europe. Thank you. Okay. Can you tell us your personal case too, for one, if, in one minute? I'm sorry? Can you tell us your personal witness in one minute? Um, if you are one of them though. Yes, I am one of them. Uh, but, <laughs> well, uh, I was a police chief for like 20 years and I'm, uh, I've also been purged by the government and I was detained for six months, yes. Can you stay afterwards? Can you talk afterwards? <laughs> okay, and uh, yes, please. My question is to Mr. Microphone, uh, please. And my question is to uh, Mr. Austerichus. Uh, so I'm very, gl very glad that we, the Magniska Act is on agenda of the European Union now. And the second thing is, we're again, very glad that uh, Sahara Europe Press would go to Turkey in this year. Uh, would they uh, consider um, the MP that Mr. Baydar uh, mentioned today, uh, the HDP the MP uh, Omar Faruk Baydar uh, uh, Gergelolu, uh, that would be uh, fantastic if he is chosen to. Yeah. Okay, uh, we can have the last questions from the, Mr. Baydar. Uh, also, in addition to the Magnitsky, Magnitsky Act mentioned, I want to uh, bring, bring 
to the attention, attention of panelists of, of Link to European Union, the CPJ, Committee to Protect Journalists, recently endorsed a report uh, prepared by a group of uh, legal experts uh, led by Amal Clooney, uh, who suggests that, in a nutshell, um, governments use targeted sanctions, such as travel bans and asset freezes, to punish and deter serious press freedom violators, including those who murder or jail journalists. I want to bring this attention to, uh, since you mentioned uh, targeted sanctions, to, to consider or to propose considering uh, the, these steps to be taken uh, by, by uh, these perpetrators. That would be a, quite a, a step, a bold, courageous step forward. Thank you. Okay. And uh, we can have one more there, and maybe yours as well. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Oh, but yeah. Yeah, me. Thank you. I've been involved with uh, rights and democratization movement in Turkey for a long while, so I want to put this question in this context. Um, acknowledging realistically that the European Union project is not a human rights project. Um, I just wanted to add to Cengiz some uh, comments, for some food for thought. Um, it's a huge economic political project. And Human rights is only one, one vector in its making. So it's, it's, a, it's a huge web of relations. And it's not necessarily directly import, export, whatever. A lot of European uh, corporate interests happen to be in Turkey and they, in many other countries, not only in Turkey, in France, for instance, they are detrimental to ecological, so, social credibility, whatever. This has been going on all over. Um, so I think it's a challenge uh, to, to, to figure out whether in the heyday, I mean the buzzword, mainstream rights and democracy into this, I mean, re, re, re-infuse this into the project because years ago in the 90s, the, the point was groups like us wanted to surf this wave, but wave is now subsiding into its actual political, I mean, economic, political uh, project. So I think it's a challenge, and I would be pleased to hear uh, from this, I'm not saying pessimistic, but more optimistically re realistic mood, I mean, uh, mode, how can we strengthen uh, the, the dynamics that push rights and democratization into this, if possible at all, into this project? Okay, so we have a... Uh, victims perspective question we have uh, European challenges itself internal challenges and how to deal with Turkey and the uh, perpetrators of human rights violations and uh, European integration is not only human rights perspective but uh, covers also uh, different titles so we have all these up a large question from the young lady at the okay back. let's have that one as well um, thank you very much. My name is Shahara Dash. I'm from the Standing Committee of European Doctors. We represent national medical associations, and the Turkish Medical Association is our member. We've had to support them through very difficult situations. Um, former executive committee is facing a prison sentence, is currently waiting appeal um, for um, defending medical ethics and put in context of a press release that said, War is a public health problem, so we are watching the situation with much concern. My question is to the members of the European Parliament. I see that you have strong cross-political uh, group activity on this issue, and I would like to ask what your plans are to keep this on the EP agenda. Thank you. Okay, okay thanks for the question. And <laughs> to excuse myself, I had a very urgent question on Venezuela and on Spanish-Venezuelan relations, which are very, very, now very sensitive for us. It's okay. We have, had to be, uh, we, we have uh, a lot of questions already, so if you feel uh, to answer it, we can uh, to contribute. But uh, I, uh, I want to open the floor for our speakers to answer uh, the, all questions. And for the last one, yeah, as I promised. Um, 
So my question is uh, to Ms. Mandel. So uh, we have been talking about this uh, impossibility of uh, furthering the negotiations, accession negotiations with Turkey for the EU membership. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, you said maybe customs union, upgrading uh, of customs union might be an option to anchor Turkey to the EU uh, relations. But, uh, to the best of my knowledge, the conditions to upgrade and update the uh, customs union agreement are only about the trade law on uh, the trade and law on public tenders. So, if we will uh, anchor Turkey to the EU with these laws, we, or if Turkey will be a country governed by rule of law, we can say China really deserves the uh, notion of. Or, or called uh, as a democratic republic. Uh, so th this, is, this is actually what Erdogan wants. This is what the uh, authoritarian regime in uh, Turkey can we, wants. Yes, wrap up a little. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, do, don't you think it will be, again, another appeasement of the authoritarianism in Turkey? Okay. So we have personal questions uh, for the parliamentary members, and then uh, the other speakers also uh, answer the other questions. We can start with Mr. Manu. Thank you for the panel discussion as well as for the questions. Uh, I never imagined that one day uh, somebody, somebody would, uh, I would say, uh, insinuate that uh, I would follow any appeasement policy on Turkey because that's not the case. We are like-minded on this panel and obviously we are like-minded in this room. And we know what's at stake. And uh, it's at stake internally for Turkey what um, uh, happens in terms of rule of law, human rights, human dignity, individual freedom, uh, and it's uh, at stake what uh, Turkey will contribute to the world positively or what way uh, Turkey will harm the world uh, in the future. And uh, maybe to go deeper into the very last question now, I, I think for it because I don't want to be misunderstood, what I have said is that there will be no Turkish membership, and that's still something people here or there dream of. There will be no Turkish EU membership. Uh, as, as long as I'm politically active, I will oppose it and many others will oppose it as well. There is no reason for an EU membership of Turkey. We have a customs union in mutual interest for jobs, economy, for employment, for development, for future opportunities. We have it. It's in place. And I was among the ones uh, when Turkey invaded Syria who wanted uh, to suspend the customs union in fall. And it's still an opportunity to put pressure on Turkey. And what I have said today is that uh, maybe someday, after a democratization process, proper and correct elections, and a change of leadership via elections, which is normal uh, and regular in a democracy, uh, of course there can be a better relationship between the Turkish leadership and the EU uh, in the future. We should never lose any sense, I would say, of hope or of optimism, but many other steps have to be taken before that. And uh, part of this uh, better relations uh, will be and could be uh, also uh, a deepening of the customs union. There should also, always also be, I would say, a purpose or a perspective uh, that also motivates people, motivates also the Turkish people who disagree with their leadership to take action and to be active and to uh, conduct opposition work in the field of uh, democracy and politics. Uh, strengthening democracy was uh, one of the questions uh, from the side of the lady. Uh, I want to put my picture of Europe and of human rights uh, next to it. If, if we could wish, in my view, if we, if we could wish a newborn baby, I would say, how to be born on this planet and especially where to be born on this planet for good future perspective, good living standards, uh, of course, in my view, uh, we would wish this baby to be born in Europe today. Hmm? So that's at least something uh, that we we can count on, and that means still we have to contribute a lot to the rest of the world in t terms of human dignity, freedom, living standards, and so on. I know you have to look after the time. Yeah. Um, so that means uh, human rights is not something uh, in the shadow of European policies or is something uh, beside anything else. Uh, human rights is the basis of everything, and uh, today's Europe is is an example in this world of uh, human dignity and individual freedom, and that's what we have to present to the world. 
via, that's the other lady said that, via uh, solving the internal problems. I voted for Article 7 uh, procedure regarding Hungary and Poland, of course, and uh, we know what we are talking about. Um, I will stop immediately. Maybe only to, to no, there, it was a, it was a strong discussion. I completely agree with uh, with the opinion that appeasement is the wrong policy. That's why I do a different policy on that. I hope uh, I could clarify that now. And uh, I like the idea. I, I don't like the idea, but I agree with the impression that uh, we are close to a situation when the Sakharov Prize could go to somebody uh, who fights for human rights in Turkey in the second largest army of NATO. Just uh, think about that, because uh, that's something uh, that puts a, uh, a large question mark on my mind. Thank you again for having me. Okay. And uh, Mr. Parliamentary member, you can add maybe on, I know you had also like personal question, and we can also finish with uh, Mr. Yes. Akhtar. Uh, we have six minutes, so three minutes for you, and the three minutes for Mr. Akhtar. Two minutes, uh, okay. uh, Perfect. moderator. Uh, you know, that uh, might be a need for some new economic agreements. I mean, life is very dynamic. But my point uh, would be that any new economic agreement with Turkey should be under condition of approval from the civil society. Then we can go. We had such a difficult debate in this House about uh, the free trade agreement with Vietnam. You, you can't imagine I mean, how many mails and um, uh, calls we received from uh, um, NGOs and uh, human rights defenders. It went, but, but. European Union still remains a community of values, apart from economic and uh, political uh, considerations and so on. Um, I think uh, this commission, uh, this establishment of European Union is much more pro-community of values. Not just outside, but we're speaking and having um, complicated debates inside, uh, not to mention the names of uh, at least two countries. So it's a proof that we are not closing an, eyes, uh, uh, an eye on, uh, uh, on, uh, on this criteria. And finally, you know, to be nominated for Sakharov Prize and to reach a shortlist stage, it's a lot. It's a lot. I mean, probably not to win, but even to uh, to be nominated for the short list, it's something which might be very powerful uh, political signal to anybody who doesn't like human rights and fundamental freedoms. Thank you. I didn't go on purpose on the economic matters, but let me give you some figures. Uh, it's the FDI, first of all, the foreign direct investment. Uh, the, uh, the stock in Turkey is around 180 billion. 75% comes from EU countries. And um, this is for the FDI. Now, for the trade, uh, of course, uh, for Turkey, it's extremely important, and it hovers around 150 billion a year. Uh, it is, it's, it's important for Turkey, but, of course, for Europe, it's peanuts, I mean, compared to other uh, partners uh, of the bloc. Um, 150 billion. Now, um, there are 22,000 EU companies, either directly held by, by EU capital, or uh, with uh, shares in, the, in those companies, 22,000, out of which 7,000 German companies, 2,800 Dutch companies, and so on. I think the France came third, uh, and, uh, followed by the Italians. Um, and the EIB funds. Now there are some developments there. Uh, I, I, uh, I didn't mention it. The EIB funds are, are now, uh, you know, they're, they're no more. I think uh, there is a decision by the EIB Council uh, that the, the European Investment Bank, huh? uh, they are not, uh, but since years, EIB together with EBRD, but then the World Bank, and name it, I mean, the major financial institutions of the world were financing, I'm sorry to say that, the regime. Uh, we should face it. Frankly, I'm not expecting much, but if they can attach some strings, at least to the arms sales, it would be already a lot, you know. Um, quite to the contrary, I mean, uh, I will take the, the, these two last minutes uh, the, the, to inform you about, uh, you know, uh, not necessarily a human rights related issue per se, but it, has, it would have also uh, consequences on the human rights, the so-called Istanbul Channel, 
the new Bosphorus that uh, the regime would like to build on the, uh, 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 between the Black and Marmara Seas. It is a worldwide, at least regional, disaster. It implies three member states, Bulgaria, Romania, and Greece. And um, uh, it will empty, slowly but surely, the Black Sea. You know why? Because there is 30 centimeter difference between the Black Sea and the Marmara Sea. So they will be opening a one-way tap, whereas the Bosphorus is two ways. This is why, until today, the Black Sea didn't empty up. So what it means? It means that, that the Dnieper, the Dniester, Volga, uh, the uh, Danube, they will all you know, be forced to feed the Black Sea, which will slowly empty up. And, uh, it, and there is no strategic impact analysis of this huge project. To the contrary, there are companies from Europe lining up to, to get involved and make money out of it with a project which has no environmental nor strategic, it needs a strategic, of course, impact analysis. I mean, I can give you the names. Uh, Jan de maybe for the next discussion. Okay. <laughs> uh, I just would it. like to... Uh, so, I mean, it's, okay. it's, so what I mean, the, the, the interest, the interest, the interest-based approach is unfortunately running the show, and we will have extreme difficulties for the, uh, you know, to, 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 to tell Mr. Erdogan to what to do and not, not, not to do. Thank you. Okay, before uh, uh, closing, uh, my, Mr. Herman Terz uh, might like to no, say. I mean, I, no, no, it has no sense. I mean, I don't know what was said already. I mean, I am, I am by God, no, no appeaser either. So I think, I think Erdogan has to have a tough, a tough way of approach. And I am, I am really pessimistic about the, the possibility of seeing another collapse in the region, which would be a, a disaster in, in bringing us all down into a, into a regional chaos. Uh, what, that's a little bit the point I wanted to stress. Okay. I had, as I say, I had to go because of an issue which is related in the sense that we have another chaos, we have another tragedy, humanitarian tragedy, which is in Venezuela, which is almost Syria. No? Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, that's, uh, that's the, another point in the globals no, of, of, to care about. But as I say, I'm, I'm for, I, must, I must say I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit scared about the last, the last uh, signals that we are seeing in, in the in the in the region. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Mavridis. Yes, just a closing note. Uh, I would I would I would close up with a positive note. First, I'd like to say and express how proud I feel that I hosted this event, and for that matter, I'd like to congratulate once again Vocal Europe. Also, I'd like to thank all the panelists for their contribution, and hopefully, we're going to have a chance to talk about this in the future. And the last remark is this: to my understanding. And I think I express the vast majority of my colleagues, Europe and the European Union, despite its challenges and weaknesses, still remains the best peaceful, value-based, rule-based political system around the globe today. Thank you, all of you. Thank you.